Um, all right, one minute past four. So I got reminded we should. Um, Got to remind you we should get started, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the colloquium speaker today, Professor Thomas Solomon. You see, it's uh, four o'clock, and Professor Solomon actually um, got his undergraduate training from Brown University, and then <laughs> wonderful. He told me that. Introductory physics class you took with uh, our own Professor uh, Pakovitz. And that was sort of a physics 50, 70 um, equivalent at that time. And so uh, <laughs> Professor Solomon um, went on to do a PhD at uh, UPenn and, and then uh, took a postdoctoral position at uh, UT Austin. And then I actually know and highly respect the PhD advisor and postdoc advisor that he has worked with. So, and after that, he joined the faculty at uh, Bucknell University. And then uh, professors, right, become boring. You've been professor there for the past 30 years. And what's really impressive to me when I um, sort of look into uh, Professor Solomon's um, sort of professional track and things, that he has been able to uh, lead a very creative, um, original research program in a place, you know, with, you know, very strong undergraduate education, but, you know, not the luxury of a large number of PhD students we have. And then I could just not even imagine how my research program would be without the PhD students contributing to it. And then, but nonetheless, he has done that very successfully, has been funded by NSF through multiple grants over the past three decades. And most notably, uh, a few years back, he was awarded the presidential professorship at the Bucknell University. And uh, let me, all right, looking, it's wonderful. I'm not going to dwell on like re you know awards and other accomplishments of his career. And then, frankly, I, I mean, a cover I didn't really get to study. I was looking a search on it, and then I saw, you know, all the listings. Uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, so I've forgotten my own password on those things, but I found one link that I can click and said, rate your professor. I was just looking at that, you know. Oh, God. Ratings, <laughs> they will send him about, you know, exciting, enthusiastic, you know, inspiring professor. There's only one thing toward the end that says he gives a lot of homework problems. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, I don't know if that's wonderful. It's not so wonderful, but well, just uh, I couldn't help but laughing when I saw that. Anyway, I'm not going to take more time, and, and Thomas, Professor Solomon, so nice having you here. Okay, Enjoy thanks. hearing your talk. So I have to say um, that it was really fun for me coming back here to give a talk. I've been walking around campus this morning getting very nostalgic for back in the 1980s when I was a student here and, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, um, you know, late nights at Barrison and Holly and studying at The Rock. I never studied at The Silite because I hated that building. Um, uh, going for ice cream, Alice's uh, ice cream place, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, going down for East uh, Providence uh, to get some Portuguese sweet bread. And I was just commenting that I think uh, Bob, ac Bob actually uh, verified that this is actually the room where I had my fr first year uh, uh, physics class, where Bob, I think he was like five years old when he taught this class. Um, so. Uh, um, I want to encourage you all to interrupt me. Basically, the last 20 minutes of my talk, I can skip it if we're running out of time. I will not go past. I will not go late. I hate it when people do that. Um, so if you have questions, just ask them. If you don't, I'll just talk about more material here. Um, so the work that I'm going to be describing is all about active mixing. And I'm going to define what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, and the key idea behind. Uh, what did I do with my, oh, it's in my pocket. Um, the key idea behind everything I'm going to be talking about here is um, we're really looking at this idea of a universal theory that describes very, very different systems uh, in these experiments here. And I need to comment here. Um, Jay mentioned that Bucknell doesn't have any graduate students. These are the undergraduates who have worked with me on these experiments here. And 
everything that I'm going to show you, all the data was taken by undergraduate students. So what I like to do is I like to title this talk, How is a Swimming Microbe Like a Forest Fire? This is a very physics-oriented approach where we take two very different systems and say, forget about the details, the basic physics is the same thing. So that's kind of the theme for the whole talk here. And I also want to encourage you, if you have questions, interrupt me. I'm actually cool with that. If you have a question right in the middle, raise your hand. We'll stop. We'll take your question. Um, that's cool. I'm perfectly fine if you want to do that. So let's talk about what we mean by active matter. So active matter is a real hot topic in soft condensed matter physics these days. The basic idea when someone talks about an active system, they're talking about a system with some sort of internal energy source. Now here's a problem that has been really, really popular. And in fact, there's several people here who are studying this problem of what are called active liquid crystals or active pneumatic systems. I'm not actually going to explain this because this isn't my research area, um, but it's really cool. It deals with these microtubule systems. Um, more relevant to what we are dealing with is self-propelled organisms. So a swimming microbe, this is basically an algae molecule that is able to swim, is an example of a system with an internal energy source. Or alternatively, um, there are these things called Janus particles. People make synthetic swimmers, basically um, small colloid-sized particles that are able to self-propel in a fluid flow. Or if you go to other scales, you can talk about birds and fish. These are all self-propelled. Um, of course, I am an example of a self-propelled particle. I'm able to move around the lecture hall. Um, but you get all sorts of interesting kinds of collective behavior uh, when you're looking at uh, a large number of these systems. This is a murmuring or uh, schools of fish. That's not the regime that we're going to be looking at. Um, and this is also extremely relevant to um, ocean phenomenon and atmospheric phenomenon. These are examples of blooms of cyan cyan cyanobacteria. And I'm going to come back to this picture here because what's going on up here is incredibly similar to what we see in our experiments. So there are a lot of applications of active matter systems. So first of all, of course, we're physicists. We study something because it's cool, because it's interesting. But it also happens that there's lots of applications of this. Drug delivery is a, drug delivery is a really good example. If you can imagine, um, when you take some sort of medicine, imagine that the medicine can actually swim through your body and go to the place where it is needed. Imagine you had some sort of um, uh, uh, chemotherapy, where instead of just bombing your entire body, you could deliver it in some sort of self-propelled device that could actually find the cancer cells and deliver it right there. Lots of issues of self-assembly processes, of course, biophysics, understanding cellular scale processes, and a lot of stuff in ecosystems as well. OK, so let's define what we mean by active mixing. So first things first, to talk about active mixing, we need to explain what passive is first. So a passive tracer is a tracer that simply follows the fluid without deviating from the fluid, and it doesn't have any effect on the fluid itself. So neutrally buoyant microspheres or some sort of molecular dye. By contrast, if we're talking about an active tracer, we're talking about something that deviates from the flow or somehow feeds back and alters the flow itself. Now, in this talk, we're going to just talk about two different, two different active systems. I already mentioned self-propelled organisms. That's obviously active. But reaction fronts is something that people don't always think of when they think of an active system. And I'm actually going to spend about 15 minutes, maybe 20, talking about that. Because um, it turns out this is the forest fire. We've seen how is a swimming microbe like a forest fire. So let's talk about front propagation. So front propagation is any time you have something that changes from state B to state A, and then there's some sort of some sort of interface between the two of them 
that propagates during that process. So the classic example is if you have a forest fire. In this case, B is the healthy trees, and A is the burned up trees. And the line between them is the fire itself. That's the front, uh, the front that is propagating. Um, I love showing this particular animated GIF. This is an example of a different kind of front. This is a front of an illness. Um, in this case, one state B might be healthy people, and state A can be sick people, or in a really bad case, people who have died from a particular disease. This is the bubonic plague um, moving through Europe in the mid-1300s. And what I hope you're seeing is that there's kind of this smooth front that's sweeping across the continent. Please don't ask me about Krakow. Um, I know all of you were thinking, what the hell is going on with Krakow? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question, although maybe it might be relevant here. But the thing I want you to notice here is that you've got this front that's moving through Europe. Now, let's go back a couple of years. This is the United States in, June, in, uh, in 2020 when the COVID pandemic was hitting. Um, this is actually the progression of the disease in the United States, and I hope that it is obvious that the behavior of the front is very, very different for COVID than it was for the bubonic plague in the 1300s. Now, the question is why? Well, I think the answer is kind of obvious. In the 1300s, people didn't have cars and planes and trains. They tended to stay where they were, whereas now people are traveling all over the place. Basically, it's because of mixing, that when you have mixing, it changes the phenomenon here. So one of the fundamental questions that was um, part of our research is how are propagating reaction fronts affected by fluid mixing? And clearly they are. Again, lots and lots and lots of applications of these kinds of things here. Plankton blooms are a good example where you actually see these things in the, in the oceans. Um, and there's no question that, they, that the, the, the structures you see in the plankton blooms are very much, very much related um, to the flows in the ocean. And of course, we've talked about the spreading of a disease in a moving population. So that's kind of the motivation. So now comes the theory. And the theory is really quite simple here. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine a reaction front. So basically, um, the white region is the unburned reason, region. The green is the burned region. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a little piece, a little segment of that reaction front. Now, given a reaction front in a flow, there's three things that can happen. The front can get carried by the flow. The front can actually propagate relative to the fluid, um, and the front can also be rotated by the fluid as well. So that's basically the, the quick qualitative explanation as to what's in those three equations on the bottom here. Ultimately, if we're looking at a little piece of the front, we have to signify both its x location, its y location, and also an angle that a tangent makes with the horizontal. That's why we have three equations here. Now, let's talk about this qualitatively here. We're going to focus for most, if not all, of this talk on a flow that is composed of a chain of vortices with alternating signs, so clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, et cetera. Um, and we can imagine um, looking at this both with and without a reaction. So the top part of this image here is the passive case. So a, thing, a few points to kind of note here. At the corners of each vortex, we have a fixed point there. We have another fixed point there, one at each of the corners. The fixed point of the flow is the locations in the flow where the fluid velocity is zero. So now we can also imagine uh, what's called the unstable manifold of that bottom fixed point. And the way we determine this, imagine taking 10 billion particles. We're going to put them real close to the fixed point and let them evolve in time. What's going to happen is they're going to stream away from this point along that direction. And much later in time, we basically note where they are. And that is the unstable manifold of the bottom fixed point. We can also define something called the stable manifold of the top fixed point, which is the time reversal 
of the unstable manifold. So basically, the stable manifold, the top fixed point, is all of the points that in the distant future will converge on that point. For the case of a time-independent chain of vortices, the unstable manifold of the bottom fixed point and the stable manifold of the top fixed point are, in fact, the same thing. Very boring. Um, the key takeaway, though, is that that manifold is like a barrier between all the stuff in one vortex and the stuff in the next vortex. Questions about that, if anyone wants to interrupt at this point? OK, let's imagine now that for the bottom picture, we're going to imagine that we have some sort of reaction. Let's say we pour gasoline in here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to light a match and touch it to this point here. Well, of course, it's going to catch on fire. You're going to have some sort of reaction. It can easily move away from that fixed point in the unstable direction, but it can also move outward against the incoming flow. And it's going to keep moving outward until it reaches another point where the incoming flow and the outgoing reaction balance each other. And this is going to be a fixed point for the reaction. And we call that a burning fixed point. And then we can do the same trick that we did here, put a whole bunch of tracers, in this case, these are front elements, around that fixed point, and they're going to stream out along that red curve. And that is what we call a burning invariant manifold. Now, I want to talk about the properties of that manifold. This is a movie, um, and it's going to, we're going to repeat this a couple times, that shows um, one of these burning invariant manifolds being traced out. There are some directions associated with it. And then we're going to trigger a reaction. I'm going to run this again. We're going to trigger a reaction and watch what happens to that reaction front. So let's do this again, but I want to be able to pause it. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and draw that burning invariant manifold, or at least the projection of it in x and y. And now what we're going to do here is we're triggering a reaction front, that green region. It's going to spread, because that's what reactions do. It's also getting carried by the vortex. Now watch what happens when it reaches the burning invariant manifold. So when it reaches the burning invariant manifold, it stops cold. So you have a situation where in any part of the burning invariant manifold where the blocking direction is pointing inward, it acts as a barrier. The reaction front can't get through. But the reaction front can get through the other side where the, where the, where the direction of blocking has changed. So these things are acting as a one-way barrier. If I triggered a reaction here, it would go right through that burning invariant manifold. So here's something we can test experimentally. Um, so the one on the right here is what I just showed you. There's another burning invariant manifold that I didn't show you on the left by symmetry. And these are both blocking outward reactions. So if we trigger a reaction in between the two of them, it has to go all the way around before it can get into the center of the vortex, um, the vo center of the vortices. And we can test this. Um, so here's what we do. Um, the experiments that we are doing, these are all very simple tabletop experiments. We basically have a chain of alternating magnets, so north side up, south side up, north side up, south side up, et cetera. That chain of magnets is underneath a box. And in the box, we have an electrolytic fluid, like salt water. Or in this case, we can put in the chemicals for a particular reaction that I'll show you in a second. Run an electrical current through this. When you run an electrical current through this, um, this is classic basic electricity and magnetism. The current interacts with the magnetic field to produce forcing that's this way, then that way, then this way. And that actually generates a chain of vortices. It's a really nice system that enables you to ch generate vortices without any moving parts at all. Um, now, as far as the reaction is concerned, we are using something that is called the excitable belazov jabotinsky chemical reaction. Um, the BZ reaction is well known as a reaction that can actually produce chaotic time dependence, which is really cool. But that's not what we're doing here. We're actually using this to make a pulse-like reaction front. This is just a Petri dish with no imposed flow. Now, you may wonder, why is it bouncing off the walls and coming back in? The BZ system has the ability to reset itself after about 30 seconds, and then you can trigger it again. It would be like having a forest where the trees grow back really fast. 
So you have a fire burning down the trees and they just pop right back up again and so you can burn them again. It's actually really nice from an experimental perspective. So here's what it looks like if we trigger this reaction um, in between the two vortices like I showed you before. This is the movie. These are contour lines kind of showing the edge at different times. And what I hope you're seeing is kind of a, a buildup along a certain edge here. If we make a still image of this, here's what we find. Um, so experimentally, we see the same sort of behavior as we see with the theory, i.e., these red curves are, in fact, acting as barriers that block these reaction fronts. Now, if it was only a simple time-independent chain of vortices, that wouldn't be terribly interesting. But we've tried this for a bunch of different cases, and I'm going to show you a couple more. We have extended this to a two-dimensional, still time-independent, but spatially disordered flow. Basically, what we do is we put the fluid in a box, and we have a bunch of magnets, many more than in the picture here, um, arranged randomly. So you can see kind of a random velocity field. If we zoom in on that box and we trigger a reaction in here, here's what it looks like. So this is the edge of the reaction at one time, a little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what I hope you're seeing here. There is a line right along here where the reaction's not getting through, and another line around here where also the reaction isn't getting through. So we're identifying these as burning invariant manifolds. But remember, these burning invariant manifolds are one-way barriers. So here's the test. We generate the same flow and uh, do this again. Um, but this time, what we're going to do is we're going to trigger one reaction down and to the right and another reaction up and to the left. Watch this guy. It'll go right through the first one. Remember, it's a one-way barrier. It goes right through the first one, blocks on the second one. This one here goes right through the first one, stops on the second one. So once again, these things are acting as one-way barriers. Now, if we zoom back on this, this is the whole box now. And what we've done is we've taken everything that blocks downward reactions and colored them red, and everything that blocks upward reactions and colored them green, and this blue thing is the reaction front. So when it comes back around, watch what happens every time it gets, let's say, let's say this, this, this little red thing right here. Watch what happens when it gets there. It goes all the way around. Here's another one. Watch, it kind of hits that like it's an obstacle. It goes all the way around. So these things really pop up all over the place in these kinds of flows. Our argument is that if you want to understand, oh, question? Oh, not a bad idea. Oh, I'm absolutely fine with that. Yes, now you can actually see it. Thank you, by the way. Uh, look, now you can actually see what's going on. Um, so our argument is that if you want to understand how reaction fronts move in a fluid flow, these barriers, these manifolds, are basically acting as kind of the structures that guide the behavior here. So this is still very much work in progress, trying to understand how we can actually measure, uh, how we can actually predict the speeds at which fronts propagate. Um, <coughs> we've done a bunch of experiments. We've done this in vortex arrays with a uniform flow, single individual vortices. Um, we've done this in three-dimensional fluid flows, where now the barriers are these scrolls or tubes. The bottom line is this picture works, and it always works, that for a wide range of two-dimensional and three-dimensional flows, these burning invariant manifolds act as one-way barriers that block the motion of reaction fronts. Now, I'm about to switch gears and talk about question. No, no apologies. Please ask. Yes. Is set up by the flow itself? Sorry, I, I think I mind this. So it's actually, no, this is, I didn't explain this well. It's, a, it's, it's the flow in combination with the speed at which a reaction front moves through the system. So basically, if you want to predict these things, what you have to do is you have to give me equations describing the x and y velocities of the flow, and you have to tell me how fast the reaction front moves relative to the fluid. Given those two ingredients, I can predict where every one of these is going to be. Got it. Yeah, you. great question. Back there. You mean that block in both directions? Yeah. This is an interesting question. So by the way, if we go back to the passive problem, 
the invariant manifolds are, in fact, two-way barriers. By the way, the reason why these things are only one-way barriers, and I kind of brush this under the carpet, is that they're actually structures in an xy theta phase space. So what's really going on is in three dimensions, the reaction goes underneath the manifolds in one direction, and when it goes in the other direction, it's at the same theta where the manifolds are, and that's why it's blocked. So in three dimensions, it's actually an impervious barrier. Here's a cool thing. Going back to your question, take the reaction speed, dial it down slower and slower and slower and slower until the reaction speed goes to zero. These very, very manifolds, you have a, a right blocking and a left blocking, they will collapse on each other and form a single passive invariant manifold that blocks in both directions. So they always come in pairs. Great question. Other questions? So this is where you need someone who's more than a physicist. Um, so the, Jay's question, if you didn't hear it in the back, was can we use this to actually fight forest fires? Theoretically, yes. Um, what we are dealing with here is, of course, a simplification. So we're dealing, these particular experiments are forest fires where the wind doesn't change. It's the same wind at all times. So if you now want to go to time-dependent flows, we actually have some theories that extend this to periodic time dependence. The manifold picture works very well there. When you start getting to aperiodic or turbulent flows, it becomes a more complicated problem. But um, if you go back to the work that I did back in the 1980s and 1990s on passive manifolds, people have taken those ideas and extended them to more complicated flows. And I'm convinced the same thing will apply here. But we're starting with the simplest cases. So it's one thing to talk about a spherical cow. But if you want to actually treat the cow, you've got to go beyond a spherical cow approximation. This is a spherical cow right now. Other questions? OK, so let's talk about swimmers now. And the goal I want to show you is that, is that basically the same theory applies. So now. Instead of asking how do fluid flows affect the motion of reaction fronts, we're now going to say how do fluid flows affect the motion of self-propelled tracers, whether we're talking about algae molecules or, um, or, uh, or, or um, um, bacillus subtilis bacteria. Um, again, we get these ideas of plankton blooms all over the place. These are problems with a very, very real application. Oh, it looks like there is a sound on this. Um, so this is a movie. Um, that I took at the beach one summer. My wife argued that I should um, uh, get reimbursement for our beach trip for, from NSF. Um, uh, if there's any NSF people, we did not do that. Um, so uh, this was at the beach one day. A bunch of people had uh, French fries out. And uh, people talk about different sorts. Watch, watch this bird right here. Watch this bird right here. So the bird is flying pretty hard to the right, and yet it's not going anywhere. And the reason it's not going anywhere is that at the same time, there was a very strong wind going to the left here. So here's an example of a self-propelled particle um, that is being affected. Its motion is being affected um, by the wind. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that are affecting the motion of this bird, including what I like to call French fry taxes. Um, the uh, fact that it wants to change its, be, uh, uh, change its flying because of the, the presence of nearby French fries. So the theory. This is going to sound very familiar, unless I put you guys to sleep before. Instead of a reaction front element, we're going to talk about a little ellipsoidal swimmer. So we put a little swimming organism in the flow. And once again, we need to denote its x location, its y location, and now the angle at which it swims relative to the horizontal. So that swimmer in a flow can, again, be carried by the flow. It can swim relative to the flow and it can get rotated by the flow. So take a look. The equations now for x, y, and theta are almost exactly the same as what we had before. The one difference is that we have to take into account the shape of the swimmer. So we can denote its aspect ratio, basically the long length divided by the width. That's gamma. We can then define alpha for this object here. And the idea here, if you look at this mark, this um, um, laser pointer that I'm holding. Alpha equals 1 would correspond to a long, skinny swimmer that swims like this. Alpha equals 0 is a circular swimmer. And alpha equals negative 1 would be a long, skinny swimmer that swims like this. 
That doesn't show up in nature very often, i.e., ever. Um, but alpha equals negative 1, if you put alpha equals negative 1, this kind of swimmer in here, the equations become 100% identical to the equations for front propagation. So you could argue that this is a generalization of what I was talking about before, but now we're taking into account more than just reaction fronts here. So key idea, the same thing that predicts manifolds and barriers for chemical reactions should also predict barriers for self-propelled tracers. Little preview, it does work. Um, so this is a simulation. And now we're doing a simulation of swimmers in the flow. Each one of these black dots is a little swimmer in the flow. And we are assuming what are called smooth swimmers, where they're not able to change their direction of motion other than the flow itself rotating them. Watch what happens here. You'll see these guys um, never go through that red curve to the right. But once they come around, they can easily go through in the other direction. Again, it is acting as a one way barrier. Now, I'm being a little bit glib here because it's really a structure in a three dimensional x, y, and theta space. And if you look at basically the unstable, what we now call swimming invariant manifold, um, my colleague from California named these things. It's almost a little bit too cute for its own good to call these things swims. But he came up with the idea, he gets to name them. Um, so if we look at this, this, what we now call a swimming fixed point, the manifold that comes off of that is actually this tube, this actually um, warped sheet structure. And then we can also talk about the stable manifold of that top swimming fixed point, which is also a tube structure. Project this down into x and y, that's when these things act as one-way barriers. So they're blocking in one direction. And basically what happens here is stuff in here can't get out of that tube, but when it goes around, it can go underneath it. That's how it goes back in the other direction. So that's what these swimming invariant manifolds look like. So now let's do the experiments. So we're going to use the same sort of magnetohydrodynamic forcing technique. We're going to take a channel. This channel is one millimeter across. We're going to put a, um, strips of magnets underneath it. So we're looking down on the channel. We're going to, uh, and we're going to have uh, oh, sorry, barriers on the top and the bottom. We're going to run an electrical current through this. That electrical current interacts with the alternating magnetic field to produce alternating forcing down, up, down, up, down, up, et cetera. Um, put some walls on. That gives us vortices in the flow. And this is all um, in, a, in a small system here. This is what the velocity field actually looks like in this system that we've actually measured. And now let's talk about our microbes. So um, the microbes that I'm going to show you um, right now are actually swimming algae. The algae that we're using is something called tetracelmus, which is a marine algae. Um, the reason we're using a marine algae is if we want to run an electrical current through the fluid, we've got to put salt in it. And tetracelmus love salt water. So this is what these guys look like in the absence of any fluid flow. Now we're going to put it into our system. Um, so the these movies, the top and the bottom, are in fact the same movie. The top movie is the, you can actually see the little microbes swimming. The bottom movie is the same thing, except we're connecting the dots so you can see what the paths of these trajectories are. So this is what these guys look like in the absence of any fluid flow. Now, let's turn on the flow. So the next sequence here, we now have our vortex flow on. Again, top movie and the bottom movie are the same thing, except the bottom movie, you can see the trajectories. The flow is time independent. And yet, the trajectories cross over each other. And of course, the reason they cross over each other is because they're able to swim. These guys are actually swimming while the flow is actually carrying them. So it kind of looks like a bit of a mess. But it turns out that it's actually not. We can actually use these manifolds to explain what's going on. First things first, I find this really cool. If we pull out a few sample trajectories, um, there's some interesting features here, and I want to show you what we're looking at here. So these trajectories, the black curve is showing the path of the microbe, and these little red segments are showing the swimming direction of the microbe. So if you look at this guy here, it's actually swimming to the right. And let me flip to the next thing here. Um, we can actually circle a couple features here. So you, get, you see these loops all over the place. And what we find 
is that when an organism goes through one of these loops, it ends up with a rotation of 180 degrees in its swimming orientation. So take a look at this guy. When it goes into the loop, it's swimming to the right. When it comes out of the loop, it's swimming left. This guy here, when it's going into the loop, it's swimming up. When it comes out, it's swimming down. Same thing with all of these things. There's also these things that look like cusps, which again correspond to the fl a flip in the swimming direction. Look at this guy here. Swimming downward, goes into the loop, comes out swimming upward here. So that's a very common feature. And oh, yes? That's a really good question. The answer is no. They are not confined in two dimensions. And in fact, many, many, many of the trajectories we just don't see for very long because they swim right in and out of the focal region. So basically what we're doing here is we're capturing any trajectory that happens to stay in the focal plane. But no, we're doing nothing to keep them two dimensional. Good question. Back there. What motivates them to swim? We're going to put some, uh, some motivation to these guys here. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a very glib answer, evolution. Um, uh, evolution basically has made it so that the ones that swim tend to survive and the ones that don't swim don't. Um, that's an interesting question as to why algae, because algae doesn't always swim. Um, but uh, my guess is that if you have algae that happens to be near the bottom of the ocean, swimming makes its survivability better because if it can get up to the top where there's more light, it'll survive a little bit more. But ultimately, I'm going to give you a particularly glib answer, because it does. Um, because it does. Um, so this is a physics talk, not a biology talk. Uh, yeah, by the way, it's interesting, because uh, um, the, the actual mechanisms of the swimming is super, super, super interesting. And there are some physics talks that actually talk. So, so tetracelmus. They actually do a breaststroke when they're swimming. So you've got these flagella that are doing this, except for tetracelmus, there are four of them doing it. Um, you've got bacteria that have um, flagella that are basically um, rotating like little pinwheels propelling them. Um, and there's some fascinating things about the mechanisms behind how they tumble and why they tumble. Interesting thing about it is that tumbling is kind of a flaw, but it's a flaw that actually enables them to get nutrients better. And so evolution favors that. So it's really kind of cool that evolution has kind of made all this happen here. From our perspective, we're just taking these things, throwing them in the fluid, saying, we're going to let these things swim, and we're going to look at the behavior, given however they happen to be swimming. Question. Oh, that's very relevant. It does the apply to elect if, uh, um, uh, elective. Let's try this again. Does the applied electric field affect the swimming behavior? We tested that. So we did the same experiments without the magnets in there. And we just pl uh, put the current through there without the magnets. We've seen no difference in the way they swim. Now, granted, if we put a big enough current in, eventually they would start to be bothered by it. But at the currents that we're using, we don't see any evidence of that. Great question. Yeah, actually, that's a really interesting question. The question, if you didn't hear, was could you design these barriers to try to make this more efficient here? Um, at the moment, I think it's the exact opposite. That if you actually look, let's say, for instance, let's say, for instance, you have a blockage in one of your blood vessels. What's going to happen is the flow is going to tend to form little vortices around that. And it turns out that vortices are a place where you get barriers all over the place. So if you're trying to deliver some drugs to that region here, these barriers are a real problem. They're a real problem. Um, as to whether we can actually manipulate these things, there's some very clever people out there. Um, my hope is that people will look at these ideas and say, hey, let's come up with a cool way of doing this. But um, uh, it's not something that, that, that we have simple answers to. OK, oh, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, by the way, this is really interesting here because the theory that we're using assumes that everything is a smooth swimmer. So in the absence of a flow, it swims in a straight line and it always swims in a straight line. That is absolutely not what they're doing. So in fact, sometimes they tumble. They'll swim, they'll stop, they'll change their direction, they'll tumble again. 
Um, and the, the little wiggling, so you were seeing swimmers that were doing this. What ends up happening is that you have little imperfections in the way they swim, and they tend to actually kind of spiral. And so you're seeing that. One of the things that I think is really cool about this stuff is that this really ridiculously simplified theory still manages to capture the behavior pretty well. And in fact, almost surprisingly, how good it, I haven't shown you the results yet, but you're going to see it actually works pretty decent. Pretty decent. Question. No, no, that's experiments. Yeah. No, actually, good, good question. From an experimental perspective, what we do, this is kind of cheating, but it works. Basically, what we do is we measure the trajectory. We can figure out the velocities at any point on the trajectory, and we subtract from those velocities the flow velocity. And whatever is left is the velocity of the swimming. And that's how we figure it out. Yeah, good question. OK, I still haven't gotten to the manifolds yet. So manifolds. Um, oh, by the way, I was commenting about the cusps on the previous thing. Um, this is something I showed you a little bit earlier. You get these cusps and these reaction fronts as well. So that's a little bit of a hint that we get the same sort of behavior. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take every single trajectory, every single trajectory that crosses over any boundary between any vortex. And so if we're looking at, say, this one versus this one, we're going to take these trajectories and slide them back two vortices. We're going to take these, slide them back one vortex, and also flip them, take advantage of the symmetry. We're going to do that for everything that crosses from the right to the left. So we can basically get more data. And this is what it looks like. So these are not all happening at the same time. But we can show it at the same time. And you can see these guys. Again, this is experimental data here. You can see that these guys, this is the predicted swimming invariant manifold. You can see that they're basically not getting through in one direction. They, they get stopped when they, go th go through, when they try to go through in one direction. But if you start them on the other side, they go right through. So once again, these things are, in fact, acting as one-way barriers. Now, a little farther. So we can now quantify this a little bit more by looking at the non-dimensional swimming speed. So we're going to take the speed at which these guys swim in the absence of a flow, divide by the maximum flow velocity. So 0.2 is a case where they swim it at 2 tenths the maximum flow speed. These are the crossings. What we can then do is we can put the unstable swimming invariant manifold on the plot. We can put the stable swimming invariant manifold on the same plot. And then taking advantage of symmetry, we're going to flip everything on the dotted, left of the dotted line, we're going to flip it upside down. So what this basically does is it takes the experiments and says, this is the trajectories these guys would undergo if they started between those two manifolds. And then we can look at the faster swimmers. Ones that swim faster, these manifolds are farther apart. Faster still, the manifolds are farther apart. Key thing about this is that we see the same sort of behavior, the same manifold structure for the swimming microbes as we do for the reaction front. So again, this is an example of how a swimming microbe is like a forest fire. Now, it is 15 up. I'm going to show you a little bit more. I've got way more material than I'm going to talk about. Um, but I want to give you a little bit, little, bit, little bit more of a taste of where we're going with this stuff. This is kind of cool. This is a simulation of the motion of, of 3,000 microbes initially in the center of vortex. I want to remind you that this flow is time independent. And yet you can clearly see transport as this stuff is spreading out over time. And that's, of course, because they can swim from one vortex to the next. So what we are actually doing here is we're saying that not only do these manifolds act as barriers, but they also act as guides to transporting active tracers from one vortex to the next. So basically, if you put this unstable swimming manifold next to a, swimming manif a stable swimming manifold, it forms kind of a tube or a chute. So any tracer that gets into that chute goes from one vortex to the next. So that's the mechanism behind how they go from one to the next. Now, um, this is kind of cool, because we can actually look at cross sections of this from the experimental data. This is cross section x and y, and then cross sections in x and theta at three different values of y. And so you can see that that captures the overall structure of the, of the tracers that are going from one vortex to the next. 
increase the flow, the swimming speed, increase it again. The picture works quite well. Um, this is what trying to show the same thing in three dimensions. I don't think that comes out very well. Um, but the basic idea here is that you can then use this idea to try to predict what the flux of these swimmers will be from one vortex to the next. So this little uh, dewdrop shape in the middle is basically a cross section of that shoot structure. Now there's another shoot um, from another fixed point there and there that actually transports transport tracers in the other direction. That's what's shaded in yellow. I'm not going to go into details about this, but by taking the areas of this, you can actually predict what the flux should be. I'm going to skip over this. Um, bottom line is that what we find is that the predicted flux actually works pretty well um, in matching up with the actual experimental flux of, uh, of material from one vortex to the next. Now, another thing I want to talk about, and this may take us to the end, is that you can also get chaotic trajectories. And this is also really, really cool. If you're talking about passive mixing, to get chaos, you need three phase space dimensions. Now, if you're talking about fluid mixing, phase space is real space. So the phase space dimensions are x, y. If you have a time-dependent flow, you can add time as a third dimension and you can get chaotic trajectories. Or you can get chaotic trajectories for a three-dimensional flow even if it's time independent. This is a simulation of that. Here's the cool thing. If you're talking about swimmers, then even if you have a two-dimensional flow, your phase space has three dimensions because in addition to x and y, you have the swimming direction as your third dimension here. So theoretically, it should be possible to get chaotic trajectories here. And we have some preliminary evidence of this. Um, these are actually some simulations that our colleagues did in California. And I'm actually going to show you instead a simulation that we did. Um, basically, what we did here is we started with three trajectories at the exact same location, but we gave them very, very slightly different initial orientations. So one of them swimming at an angle 2.72 radians, 2.76, 2.80. Initially, these things follow each other pretty well, but after a certain period of time, they diverge very rapidly. And it turns out that this is exponential separation, which is what you expect for chaos. Here's an experimental, an experimental directory, and we saw this one, and notice that it comes back to almost the exact same location in X and Y. So we looked at the angle as well, and when you look at the angle as well, what you find is that the angle is also almost exactly the same. So if we break this trajectory into two pieces here, and what we can do is we can follow it as it goes from one case to the next case. And notice it starts off very close, and then they diverge and go in very different directions. And if we plot the separation versus time, you see something that kind of looks almost exponential. Plot it as a semi-log, and we do have what appears to be kind of coarse-grained exponential separation. So we have some evidence that some of these trajectories are, in fact, chaotic. And that's actually the first time that people have seen chaos in a two-dimensional fluid flow, the key, again, being that these guys are swimming tracers here. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, we've also looked at, it turns out you can get both ordered and disordered uh, behavior. The, um, the, the, the ordered behavior happens at slower spinning, swimming speeds, chaotic at higher swimming speeds. We've looked at long-range transfer. I'm just trying to finish up here so I don't hold you guys long here. And I'm going to skip over this part here. And uh, um, Jay said, make sure I don't, I don't leave out the punchline. So I'm going to jump to the punchline here. Um, the punchline, like I said, we've got lots and lots of data here. I'm not going to show you all of it. But I do want to come back to this question once again of how is a swimming microbe like a forest fire? The answer to that question is, it is if you're a physicist. It is if you're looking for general universal behavior. And what we say is there are some common features. Both fronts and self-propelled tracers move relative to the fluid. So we're going to call these both active, both active tracers. Um, the same theoretical framework works for both of these. And in fact, as I showed you, the front propagation problem is actually just a special case where we're going to make 
um, it's, it's, we're gonna, it's a special case if we have a, an organism that swims like this. Same theoretical framework works, assuming we simplify things. We get these burning invariant manifolds um, uh, um, for reaction fronts, and it turns out, this is part that I skipped here, it turns out that these burning invariant manifolds are actually ultimate barriers even for swimming microbes, even if they're tumbling, even if they can tumble, even if their swimming behavior is erratic. If anybody's interested, I've got some data that I jumped over. Um, and they're both characterized by these one-way barriers, these burning invariant manifolds or swimming invariant manifolds. So the key takeaway, the key takeaway is this critical importance of these invariant manifolds as structures that really guide and block the motion um, of any sort of active impurity in a system. And of course, there is a lot of continuing work that we are doing on these experiments. Um, but we're already past um, 450, so I think at this point I will stop. Um, and if people have any questions, I would be happy to take them. Question. So the inferential interaction framework is unique in the, the relative uh, swing or swing for reaction speed is larger than the flow rate. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, I mean, the answer is yes. But if the swimming speed or the swimming if the swimming speed or the reaction speed is larger than the largest flow velocity, there's no barriers. There's no barriers. Um, this whole idea of the barrier happening because there's some places where the flow speed is equal to the swimming speed goes away if these guys are able to swim faster than the fastest speeds. Um, so <coughs> this is a really interesting question because, of course, we can talk about limiting behavior. So if we talk about limiting behavior where the swimming speed or the front propagation speed goes to zero, then it becomes the passive problem. If we talk about the limiting behavior where the swimming speed or, or the reaction speed goes to infinity, then the flow is irrelevant. So it's, it's kind of a sweet spot in the middle where we get this kind of behavior. Yeah, great question. Tom, you want to use this? Oh, good point. No, this is in the left hand half there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe this is your last bullet point, but can you say anything about the role of hydrodynamic interactions? between the swimmers, and because it seems like this is mostly predicated on just single swimmers, no? Absolutely. So everything I just told you, everything I just told you is what is now referred to, and thank you for telling me this, called the planktonic limit, where we're dealing with low enough density so you can, we can treat each swimmer as though they're completely independent of everything else. The question that you asked here, which yes, that is the last bullet, is a really, really interesting question. And I will say the conversations I had a little bit earlier um, with Jay's students and with Jay, um, they're looking at cases where they're looking at um, uh, bacteria swarms that generate fluid flows. And I find that problem absolutely fascinating because you can imagine a situation where if you have a high enough density so you get collective behavior, now these guys are generating the fluid flow and then the fluid flow then sets up these manifolds, which then affects their motion and affects their communication. And so you can imagine a situation where the flow that they generate could end up sealing off certain parts of the system. So you could end up potentially with some sort of, some sort of circular process where the, the organisms set up the flow, the flow affects the organisms, that affects the flow, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be, I think it's a fascinating question and one that we very much want to look at. And honestly, we may be talking with Jay and his students again about this. Yeah, two bad pieces of intuition that come to mind right, as I was listening to the talk. One was the analog that Bill Unruh had with um, a, the, the sound horizon and the analog of that with a black hole horizon. Yes. You can have a fluid and you know there's a sound horizon and that fluid, yada, yada. So that's one thing that came to mind. Um, the second thing that came to mind is that influence of topology. So you normally like you see there's these fixed points here, these surfaces, it reminds me of two dimensions of certain, yes. and obviously that even that is a very simplistic way of thinking about things because 
you can imagine having many boundaries. And anyway, those are two. Yeah, by the way, by the way, the black hole event horizon. So there's a, um, a researcher in, in Switzerland, George Haller, that's talking about barriers, and he actually calls them black holes. I will be honest, I'm actually kind of, you know, analogies are all very nice. I, I'm not sure, the, the question is how, how much, how far you can go with that analogy. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's barrier, barrier, by the way, this is one of the reasons why I enjoyed talking with you and your group, that when people kind of pull from one area and apply these ideas to different areas, that's when things get particularly interesting. Oh, it actually, it, so, 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 so it's not just an analogy then. You think it's actually one-to-one -one mapping? Ah, 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 okay. By the way, um, it's interesting. I gave a talk in Chicago several years about, about this stuff here. And after the talk, um, a group from what they call a flash group there, they're doing simulations of supernova explosions. And they came up and showed me their simulations, and it looked exactly like our experiments. I mean, basically, it's a front propagating in a very turbulent star. Um, again, this is part of the fun of this. This is why it's so, why it's so much fun to be a physicist because you can look at some very basic physics and apply it to ridiculously different systems. So that's, that's really cool. Back there. Uh, so a com completely different question. Okay. Um, does, do you think that this has any impact on like street design or traffic patterns? Do the, does the flow change if you actually do confine it to two dimensions like you might on a road or that's crosswalk? A that's a fascinating, by the way, I, I love giving talks. Every time I give a talk, someone comes up with something I've never thought of before. Um, and this is a good example of that. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm an idealist. This applies to everything. I mean, obviously, of course, we're dealing with simplifications here. And part of the problem when you're talking about traffic is now you have to put human beings with their unpredictable brains into the problem as well. But the cool thing about this is that I mentioned that the theory kind of even works even if things change their direction. So, uh, I guess naively I would think, yeah, it probably can, but it's going to take some people uh, with bigger brains than mine to kind of make that actually work. Uh, when you first introduced the uh, burning invariant manifolds, yeah, uh, I remember there was a you traced out the path as it was, it was like a red line, as yes, a red path. Um, was that an actual path traced by like a tracer? Uh, it was a bit. Did I misunderstand, misunderstand that? I was a bit confused. Yeah, no, that's a really, really great question. Let me see if I can, if I can go back to that slide here. Um, the reason why I love that question so much, um, so what, uh, what our colleagues were actually doing, what our colleagues were actually doing in that movie, and I'll get back to that fairly soon. Oop, 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 yeah, it was way back. In, yeah. um, uh, da, 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 you're talking about this one here. This one, yeah. Um, so what they're actually doing is they're actually simulating. Remember, we're simulating a single front element. So when we're talking about a reaction front, you've got this big front, and we're looking at just a little piece of that. Um, and so what that is is it's simulating just that little piece, but we're simulating the special piece that's coming from near the burning fixed point, so we're actually mapping out the, uh, the manifold for that. The cool thing about this is that exact same simulation would be the same if instead of a reaction front, we were actually looking at an organism but it would be an organism that swims like this, and it would be mapping out the same thing. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thank interesting you. question. Jay's getting some good exercise here. Um, yeah, so um, the, the last note when you had, when you talked about collective behavior swimmers, um, I believe that applies to birds as well, right? When you have Absolutely. these flocks of birds um, migrating or something, um, so like they always have this, um, they always fly in a peculiar pattern. Like you know, they have like a, this kind of rotate and then um, like you know. There's like these murmur it's like you know, like murmurations where they're like yeah. flocking uh -huh. together. Something yeah. like that. So that. I believe that kind of has. Um, I believe that kind of s sort of explains how um, interactions between different um, tracers and swimmers could be, uh, you know. So something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting question because I mean, of course, we see these murmurations and somehow they're interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the way in which they interact is going to determine that collective behavior. Um, so the particular organism, whether it's a bird or a fish or bacteria, actually, again, you should talk to Jay and his students because they're actually studying that problem right now, right now. 
thanks for advertising my research. Yeah. I <laughs> lunch at uh, Lewis. Are there more questions? We have had a lot of questions. I really enjoy it. Look like we should capture the professors here forever. Sorry, I have a really short question. Is is the, the fixed point here, um, um, it, what is its like stability with regard to, to theta? So actually, that's really interesting. So the stability, by the way, the stability of the fixed points um, depends on the shape of the organism. So it turns out that if you're talking about a reaction front or an organism that swims like this, it's actually stable in two directions and unstable in one direction. So it converges in two directions. And so actually what happens here is the manifold is actually for this, the manifold tends to be kind of a line, a kind of a curve. Whereas if you're talking about something that swims like this, it's unstable in two directions and stable in one direction. So the manifold tends to be a warped sheet instead. Yeah, that's actually a, really, that's a really important question on, on the properties of these things here. Yeah. Thank you. Are there more questions? Um, let's take a pause before we change our minds. And thank you for the speaker again for such an exciting talk. Okay, let me turn this off. That was